Welcome to the Growth Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Natividad. Today we talk with Corinne Watson, an e-commerce content marketer who has worked at Big Commerce and now leads content marketing at Postscript. We talked about networking, predictions for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and why content marketing in general needs to take a big step forward. So Corinne, um, Nat told me how you guys met. I think you had just moved to Austin. You're reaching out to some marketing folks in the area. Um, I'd really love to hear more from you about how you've cultivated your professional network and sort of how you think about networking in general. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I feel like I'm actually pretty fortunate to have Austin as my home base just because there are a lot of marketers, specifically e-com marketers here. Um, I, when I first moved to Austin, I remember setting a really ambitious goal at the first startup that I worked at. We had like smart goals that we had to create and a few of them were professional development based. And I remember <laughs> thinking to myself, committing to myself that twice a week I would go to a meetup and or some kind of networking event and meet someone new. Um, I look back and I'm like, two times a week was a lot. <laughs> but I had a lot. It. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I look at it now and I'm like, there's no way. Uh, but I was I was working downtown, like you would just hop over to co working spaces and stuff like that. But it's how I met a lot of um, connections that I still hold to this to this day and friends too. Um, so that was something that I did for a while. And then when I eventually moved into the e-com space at Big Commerce, there was just such a rich community of people in Austin who, who work in that space. So uh, one by one, just kind of reach out to people on Twitter and meet their friends and go to meetups. And that's how I ended up meeting Nat. Um, I actually remember he was, he, I think he had just closed on the, the land for his cafe. <laughs> and so we were over there and, and I, I was checking it out with him. It was a good time. Um, but networking is hard. I mean, there's, there's such a balance between like making sure that it's not artificial and making sure you're being your truest self. Um, so I always try to approach it as meeting a friend rather than meeting someone who you want to like gain something from professionally. Yeah, that's a good point, I think. And I think also finding a way to convey that when you reach out to someone that you're not saying, hey, can I sell you something or can I have it? Can I get a favor from you? Um, yeah. Yeah, I always, I, for a while it was like, can I buy you coffee? But even then I'm like, well, no, because your time is really valuable. So I don't know. I feel like there's always a new way to kind of innovate. And especially now when people aren't doing anything in person, I feel like the whole concept of networking has changed, not in a good way, in my opinion. I love in per mm -hmm. I love like in-person connections, so it's hard for me to do a lot remotely. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I'm finding, I mean, interesting that you point out how networking is so different now, because I myself am finding that I'm spending a lot more time in Twitter DMs than I used to spend on like conference calls or calling up friends of friends. Yeah, I mean, Twitter DMs is a really great place to do a lot of networking, especially these days. Um, for sure, that's where I found a lot of folks. Yeah, and then and continue to. Yeah, and it's also a good way to have a little bit of a personal interaction with someone without having to make the ask of, "Hey, can we hop on a Zoom call for half an hour?" Or I pepper you with questions. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I also think it just also has to do with like the space you, where you are in your career too. I again, when I was earlier in my career, I was really ambitious and, and trying to meet a lot of people at once. And now it's like, okay, I've met, I have a good base of folks that I can reach out to, and yeah, I have to like double down on other stuff too. Yeah. So let's talk about big commerce. Um, this, you know, big commerce, as we know, is you know a major SaaS e-commerce company. Um, tell me more about your time there and some of the content that you created while you were there. Yeah, totally. At, at first, like I'll, I'll kind of mention my move there because I think it, it is pretty indicative of a lot of people's professional paths. I had been at a startup for a while. It was like a nine person startup in the fintech space. And then I thought to myself, I wanted to work at a larger company. And I'm so glad that I made that switch because it made me realize what a passion I have for e-com. I worked in e-com right out of college. It was really great to get back to my roots there. And then also to try my hand at an organization that had just like this machine that I could kind of plug into and, and tap the resources from. It was awesome. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. It was, it was a blast. Our editorial strategy, I was lucky enough to be entering the content organization 
where there is this like awesome machine already running. Um, they had fantastic SEO that had been developed for like five, four or five years. There was a team in place that was wonderful as well. Um, one thing that I think really differentiated our content at the time when I joined was it was, it was like top notch SEO content, um, but it was also educational in nature. So this is something that I have constantly been trying to reinforce in my career is that it can be both SEO uh, and, and educational in nature, which I think is something that growth machine really knows in ins and outs of. Um, but yeah, the broader content editorial strategy at Big Commerce was very much educational in nature. We had um, our, our blog posts that we would publish two to three times a week. And then it was a large organization. I think it was like 500 folks at the time of my departure. Um, and so there, we were kind of a service organization. So I worked really closely with our partner ecosystem, um, especially on a lot of like events and playbooks and webinars that all just featured our partners. Uh, but then we also had an entire international team to support, campaigns team to support. So it was like our fun SEO content, but then also fulfilling the requests of a lot of different teams ac across the org. And when you say partners at Big Commerce, the partners are people who have bought your software, which they use to sell to other customers, to sell products to customers? So it, it, it's very much like uh, the Shopify ecosystem where there are agencies who are kind of dealing big commerce as part of their e-commerce tech stack for clients. And then the technology partners, the people who plug into the big commerce ecosystem, um, whether it's like a Clavio who does email marketing, um, a Postscript who does SMS marketing and stuff like that. So kind of two different types of partners, um, each with their own unique content needs. Got it. Got it. So, and so when you talk about educational content, I'm curious what that means for big commerce. Is this educational content for the partners? Um, is it to educate people about what big commerce does? I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's all of the above. Um, enablement is certainly a component when you're working with a partner or organization. If they don't understand your product, they're not going to sell it effectively. Uh, and then also just kind of staying away from a lot of the promotional content. I mean, we had a copywriting team that was really great at writing web, web copy and call to actions and kind of the stuff that sold the big commerce product. But we wanted to tap more into how can we make these people successful in e-commerce? So rather than just here's how you list items to your big commerce store, it was here's how to create an omni-channel strategy. Here's how to make your, uh, your, your products be listed correctly. Here's how to actually market your products across whether it's in d2c space or it's b2b or it's wholesale whatever it is that that sort of educational stuff um, now i want to talk about your shift within e-commerce to sms marketing over at postscript how did you how did you make that transition and you know why did you make that transition yeah yeah it's actually it's a fun story i mean i was kind of at the point at big commerce where Again, that engine was really running with content. The team was phenomenal. Um, we were kind of in, in prep mode for the big IPO, which we can talk about now because it happened. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to get back to the startup space. I, have, I, I don't think I'll ever in my career be, be someone who was just an overseer. Um, and I found myself just managing a lot of writing rather than actually getting into the weeds and writing myself. Um, so I wanted to to move to an organization that didn't really have much of a strategy in place so I could help create it. And then, uh, yeah, be able to dip my toes into a lot of different projects at once. Um, one of the wonders of working at a startup, some people might call it a fault, but I think it's, it's wonderful, is the fact that you can experiment. Um, and so that's kind of what we've been doing and, and trying to kind of see what sticks, um, all the while taking advantage of SMS marketing, which is, by far the best new channel in e-commerce. Um, and that was kind of the second reason why I made the switch was because I knew I wanted to stay in e-commerce. I, I think I'll keep my entire career in this space. Um, but there's not a lot of places to go uh, that were really as challenging for me. I didn't know much about SMS, but I did know after doing a lot of research and writing articles about it, that it is definitely a channel that a lot of people need to take advantage of. Um, and it was the next best thing. So I found the team. They were wonderful. I mean, we have three co-founders who are the most 
energetic and friendly guys I've ever met. Um, and it's just been a blast so far. You hit on a couple of things I wanted to ask about. So you mentioned a great benefit to working in a startup is the ability to experiment, which I very much agree with. And I think what's cool about that is if you're at a startup, you know, where your following is smaller and you're experimenting, there's a little bit less of concern of, oh no, what if I mess up? And of course you don't want to mess up, but I mean, there's, there's that room to play where at least you're not thinking about, oh no, I made this minor mistake and now 10 million people saw it. <laughs> there's yeah. a benefit to knowing that, okay, this maybe didn't move the needle today, but let's try the next thing. And that's fun. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, there's nothing better than that. Um, especially, and I know we'll get to this eventually, but especially with content marketing, um, I hate the term playbook. I really, I really do because I think, especially as we move to 2021, what people have been doing for content marketing, especially in e-commerce is not going to work anymore. Um, it's a lot of repetitive content. Uh, it's a lot of people just regurgitating the same quotes, uh, after each other. So it, it, that's when you need to experiment. And I have been blessed to have a team, uh, beside me and, a, a C-suite of, people in the organization who completely embrace that and understand the the power of content marketing, which is a gift in and of itself, because I, there are so many people out there, um, especially executives who don't understand content marketing. That's it's, it's difficult. Sometimes it's not just posting up a bunch of 500 word blog posts and calling it a day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could do that, but you wouldn't be successful. What's something that you feel like has been overdone in e-commerce? Just, I mean, that, the, the yeah. really just pillar annoying content with no examples, um, no backlink strategy, uh, just like the 500 words of stuff that you've already heard before. Um, I, I think that if your content has an ulterior motive, um, granted, all content does, all, all marketing content does, it's to get revenue or leads or what have you. But if it's really apparent what that ulterior motive is and you're not doing it correctly, um, which again is why I try to be as educational as possible in the content that I create. Yeah. And to that point that to me makes it even clear where you saw the opportunity in SMS marketing or, you know, in, 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 in Postscript, right? Because it's such a new and it's an, an emerging platform that people are, starting to leverage in a better way now. How do you think yeah. about, how do you think about how that informs your content strategy now at PostScript? Uh, I, I think of it as like what email marketing was back in maybe 2014, um, where there was kind of like an empty plot of land where people started to slowly build the foundation of a house. And now we have these huge, behemoth tech organizations who are, you know, IPOing for tons of money or getting acquired or just, again, providing value um, to customers. So it's, it's just that, right? It's making sure you have a balance of, okay, I want to write enough good SEO driven content to make sure people know who we are <laughs> and can associate us with good SMS um, strategies, but at the same time, make room for experimentation too. So I don't want to be running a play a playbook. I have some pretty interesting tricks, not tricks necessarily, but ideas up my sleeve for next year. Um, so we'll see. Cool. Um, something else you alluded to earlier was, you know, content marketing and the executive team. How do you think about, I guess, selling up the vision of content marketing to the executive team? That's a good question. Um, I, I think a really easy way to do it is to do like an audit of your site to see just how much traffic can be put into your website. Um, if you just put out maybe three articles a week, um, also just looking at what your competitors are doing, if they're ranking specifically in spots that you should be ranking in, um, putting a number against those missed opportunities, whether it's pulling over stats from PPC to understand like this is how much it costs on PPC. What if we could get it organically? Uh, and then I think a lot of it has to do with partners as well. Um, if you can get like 
four or five tech partners or agency partners to sell the idea of, oh, we'll market with you better if you provide us with enablement content or white labeled content, like that can help sell it as well. Uh, it, it also just depends on having a member of the C-suite who is really invested in marketing in general. Um, and I think that we've kind of seen the shift in paid advertising to more organic versions of marketing. So just continuing to ride, ride that wave. Yeah, what you said about white labeled marketing, or sorry, white labeled content. That's interesting. I think there are a lot of ways that different kinds of companies can take advantage of that, especially if you're working with a lot of partners or if you're in some B2B space where you work with brokers that connect you to other customers. I think yeah, that's... yeah. I mean, we we don't do that at Postscript, but at Big Commerce, it was a lot of like, oh, if we were to create a guide to e-commerce, um, if you want to put your logo next to ours and kind of package it up as an offering to your clients, it we got a lot of requests for that, for sure. It's You're doing the work for them, so it's super yeah. helpful. That's a great idea. And that also just makes that content feel really premium for the person receiving it. I mean, and it is premium. It doesn't just feel that way, but it is. Yeah, I mean, it's tailored to them too, which is always, personalization is a big thing as well. <laughs> yeah, and SMS marketing helps you to be very personalized in your communication. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the largest things that I kind of realized after moving into the postscript organization is that it's, it, it has to be like pretty hyper-personalized. Um, it's not like email <laughs> at all. I mean, it's a channel, but that's kind of where a lot of the similarities between the two of them end. How do you think about the differences in email marketing and SMS marketing? I mean, I, I've always been somewhat of an email marketer um, throughout my career, whether it's just like sending out a newsletter or I used to do campaigns back in the day. Uh, SMS is, it's just a pretty sensitive channel. People are on their phones all the time texting with family and friends. If you're a brand who wants to join those conversations, you have to do it eloquently. Uh, so sending like huge blasts out to lists is not going to bring you the right kind of ROI because you're going to annoy people and it's super easy for them to unsubscribe. Um, and then also just don't think of SMS marketing as simply just sending out promotions. There are a lot of different use cases uh, across a lot of different industries to use SMS marketing, which is one of those things that I didn't really realize until I was researching it. Um, but consider using it as like a chat with your customers to chat back and forth or send them a text when their order has been delivered. Um, any kind of transactional text messaging as well. There's just a lot, a lot that you can do outside of promotions for us. Yes. It's a great transactional channel. I mean, when I get text messages about my order being shipped out and then it getting delivered, I love seeing that, you know, over text because when, especially when it's a purchase you've already made, you want to make sure that it gets to you. Yeah. And, and I feel like, I feel like there, you know, when, when companies are afraid of SMS marketing, I feel like it's because they're afraid of reminding people that they gave them money and they're reminding people to unsubscribe when that is not the case. Yeah. And well, it's also like a, a, a really com like regulated industry. So you're getting people who have specifically put their phone number in and, and asked to be given text messages. Um, which is kind of how email is supposed to act as well, but sometimes things fall through the cracks with email. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very regulated. So you have to make sure that you're sending like concise messages. You only have 160 characters. Um, otherwise you're going to get unsub unsubscribes all the time. Yeah. Have, have there been any especially clever campaigns that you've seen over SMS? We are in the thick of Black Friday, Cyber Monday planning over at PostScript. Um, so a, a lot of the stuff that they that people did in the holiday season last year, I think we'll probably make a resurrection for this year as well, but something fun like the 12 days of, of gift miss. <laughs> uh, but out, outside of the Black Friday, Cyber, Cyber Monday campaigns, we have a number of customers who are like subscription based. Um, so they'll send you reminders, letting you know that your next package is coming. Um, one of our merchants, they're called Hydrant. They're like a powdered um, supplement company. They will predict when you're running out of your um, 
your supplements and send you a text and say, hey, uh, we noticed that, or we think that you might be running low. If you want to re-up your supply, just simply respond yes, and we'll get it taken care of, which I think is really, I mean, awesome. Who's going to say no to that, right? Just respond to yes. Um, and then also, I, I feel like COVID has made a lot of people take a more of a community-driven approach to their marketing in general. Um, so we have a number of customers who will send like personalized touches, like, hey, we're thinking of you, you know, um, how can we help you be more mindful this week? Um, how are you feeling? We have a, a customer called Judy, their emergency preparedness kits, and they'll send like emergency preparedness tips, which I thought was very timely and interesting. So, I mean, the possibilities are endless, right? And it's, it's not just, hey, we're having a Labor Day sale. Here's 15% off. Yeah. Um, on to that point about Black Friday, Cyber Monday, do you have any hypotheses about, about that upcoming season that you're comfortable sharing? Yeah, I, I was just sharing with our team today that Amazon announced usually Prime Day's in June or July. I want to say July June. usually, I think. July, yeah. but they just, they pushed it because of COVID. And so now it's October 13th and 14th. So it's Prime Day's. Um, and a lot of people are seeing that as kind of the kickoff to the holiday season. So I'm like, you know, buckle your seatbelts. We're, we're doing it in like two weeks. Um, that, so of course, that's kind of the largest prediction across the e-commerce space, which is it's going to happen a lot sooner. It's not going to just be a week of cyber deals. It's going to be months. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are going to be a little bit hesitant to do shopping because of shipping delays that might happen. Um, we already know that a lot of the post service is already bombarded uh, with a lot, the amount of people who are shopping online. So I would keep, keep an eye out for like shipping delays. Um, and then of course, this one's super obvious, but more people are going to be moving their sales online than in store. Um, Black Friday traditionally was uh, the day where you lined up after Thanksgiving and got your flat screen TV at Kohl's after sitting there for eight hours, but that's not going to be the case anymore. It hasn't been for years, but this year will be another reminder of that. Yeah. We'll have cyber Friday and cyber Monday. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I remember looking at this at big commerce. Like I don't think that people are necessarily going to wait until cyber Monday to make a lot of their purchases because it used to be that retailers would wait and offer their largest promotion on Cyber Monday. But now I think that it's going to be just continuous throughout the season, but it would be interesting to see. Um, yeah. And then also just like the, the omni-channel mix that people use when they're promoting their sales. Um, I think a lot of folks are going to use SMS. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see if, if Amazon's Prime Day has an effect on on everyone else's sales, because I, I can imagine smaller retailers feeling like, oh, they're selling, they're doing Prime Day on the, on the 13th and 14th. Maybe we should do something too. <laughs> yeah, I, as a consumer, I have never really been interested in Prime Day. Uh, mm -hmm. I also don't buy many electronics and I feel like Prime Day is primarily focused on electronics. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to see if there are any other deals. Yeah. That'll be interesting. I, it's something I've always kept an eye on, but it doesn't tend to be a big shopping day for me myself. Yeah, me either. Yeah. Cool. Well, something you've mentioned a little bit in our oh, something. Wow. I'll start over. <laughs> something you've meant alluded. Something you've alluded to uh, in the conversation earlier was this notion of content needing to take a big step forward. Uh, we talked about this a little bit the other day, and I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on this. So what do you think are the big opportunities that, or the opportunities that content needs to take advantage of? Yeah, I, there's so many ways to answer this question, but I'll, I'll start by kind of framing what my content marketing ethos is. Um, every piece of content that I publish needs to have one, examples, um, and it has to be run by people who are actual operators in the space. I'm not an e-commerce operator, so I don't have that context. So I need, I need to be checked by someone who does examples. Um, as a marketer, I am continuously frustrated when I stumble upon a piece that gives me no practical examples to help supplement 
the point that they're trying to convey. Um, and then for it to be something like something new that hasn't necessarily been created before. If I am creating a piece of content uh, in a direct response to try to outrank a competitor, I do not want it to be the same format as them. Not only will Google hate that, but also it just feels really disingenuous. Um, so that's, that's the way that I view content marketing. With that being said, all of that applies to written words, um, which I don't think it, it'll always hold a, a space in content marketing, but I think diversification is going to happen sooner rather than later. We've seen people become extremely successful with YouTube strategies. I think video will play a pretty ginormous part in 2021 content marketing. Um, and then just other mediums as well too. Everyone's on their phone. They're going to be on their phone forever. There's not going to be a movement away from that anytime soon, especially because of COVID. Um, so finding ways to communicate with folks on a smaller screen. So whether it's through their ears um, or if it's through, again, a video, something that's more interactive, like a chat bot, there are a lot of different ways rather than just large chunks of copy. Um, it's more, I, I like to call it like a sensory experience, uh, which sounds really bizarre and spa-like, but if we're not, if we're, if we're just appealing to one sense, it kind of works, but it would be better if we were to be in their ears, in their eyes, in their heart even, um, which leads me to just more community-based content and empathetic content. Um, no one wants to just be listed off a, a article of like 15 e-commerce techniques. It needs to be contextualized for them, personalized if it can be, um, and written with like not an opinion as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, written with a with a point of view, with a strong yeah, point of view. Rather, yeah, rather than just like super ob objective. Because um, there's there's already so much of that out there. Yeah, I do, yeah, I don't think people are as interested in seeing twenty five e commerce tactics you should try. I think yeah. they are much more interested in hearing about one and really digging into that into the how and why to do that like one yeah topic you need to hearing, try, from the hear brand, the hearing from the brand that did it seeing real examples seeing the amount of revenue associated with it i mean case studies are a whole new i could talk about case studies now i think those need to evolve for a while but all of this to say content marketing should probably become a lot more diverse in the, in the next few years because especially in e-com i know i've said that a lot in this conversation but there's just a lot of regurgitation of ideas um people are running out of things to write about if it's just e-com related so retail pulling in more ideas from b2b and wholesalers and kind of reaching to the areas that people have not written about before yeah i think there's a lot of the that that worry about keeping up with competitors like oh this competitor said had this listicle we should do the same one <laughs> Well, I would be curious to kind of hear about how Growth Machine is, is looking to pivot as well. Or not necessarily pivot, but to embrace this kind of change. I mean, are you seeing requests from clients that are more media-based? Or is it still just, are you guys just producing killer content? Right. So. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question, especially because SEO, by the nature of it, is very competitive. I mean, so as I, as I think about content creation, I don't think as much about, oh, how can I write something better than Backlinko about link building? Because they have a terrific resource on link building. I think more about how can I educate our prospects or our customers about this idea and what it means to them? Um, or how to, what's our point of view on it? How do we do this thing? So I kind of see our content as more educational, with respect to the way we think or how we do business. And I also think about it like, what are the different ways we can present this content to someone? So this is also why we, we relaunched the podcast um, because I don't, I don't think people are always looking for a blog post to read. They might be looking for some great ideas to listen to while they're on the go, while they're exercising or whatever it is that they're doing while they're listening right now. Um, so that's, that's a lot of what I think about. I, I, I mainly just think about what is Growth Machine's unique point of view in something? Why do we care about it? 
and what do we have to say about it? Or what's, what's our specific use case or case study for something? Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, podcasts are so funny because I think it's a little bit tricky to, to track the ROI of them. Um, but at the same time, like when you're looking to research something new, I at least will immediately go to like, okay, what are the newsletters I need to sub- subscribe to? Who do I need to follow on Twitter? Whose blogs do I need to read? And then whose podcast do I need to listen to? That's kind of like my four tiered approach to learning about something new. Um, so I think there's totally a space for it. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk about you. Uh, you mentioned case studies and how those need to evolve too. I would love to talk about that more. What do you think about case studies? I mean, I am by no means a, a, a product marketing expert and I haven't been. Um, and I feel like case studies kind of lie in that, in that zone sometimes. With that being said, um, I did help manage our case study program over at Big Commerce. Um, and there, it, again, is a, just a lot of repetition. Um, I don't know. I mean, I always feel really excited when I am having a one-on-one conversation with an e-commerce operator, um, when I'm in their space, uh, when I'm in like their warehouse or I'm in their storefront and I'm talking to them about their products. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and sometimes that just doesn't translate over to written content. Uh, so much like I see content marketing evolving, I think case studies should probably evolve to something that's a little bit more interactive, personalized, um, probably video based, et cetera. Um, I also just like, I'm, I have trouble sometimes figuring out uh, where in the marketing funnel a case study should live. Um, I've seen it be used primarily as a sales tool, which I think makes sense, right? If you're trying to close a lead in there, an outdoor brand, you should totally send them a few case studies from outdoor brands, but also, how can those be used in content too? Um, so yeah, it's just something that I'm thinking through. We just hired a, an awesome product marketer over at PostScript that I'm hoping to float some ideas off of, but I don't expect it to be the same, you know, like those little handout PDFs of here's this brand, this is the ROI that they saw on the revenue. Like, who knows? <laughs> well, something I've seen be successful is, especially if you have a, a library of case studies that to already work with, is creating that sort of, I guess, thought leadership piece, like, I don't know, take a fake example, like four SMS messages you, you need to say, and it's advice like that backed up by the case studies. So then it would be like, oh, this one customer used this message for this reason. Um, so just kind of finding new ways to repackage parts of the case study. I've seen that be really successful. Yeah. Yeah. And then just like we, so we launched really good texts on PostScript um, a few months back and just having a library, like you said, of different resources. I think that might be something that people kind of iterate towards in the future as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, something I wanted to ask about was PostScript's um, SMS certified platform. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to learn a little bit about how that came to be. Um, sort of what, you know, what problems PostScript is trying to address when they launch that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak to it as eloquently as our fantastic director of community, Alicia Thomas, can. Um, she was, the, that's definitely her, she's a brainchild of that. Um, but the way I see it, I think that m- much like I came into the SMS space with the misconceptions that I should be treating it just like email, a lot of marketers are doing the same thing. Um, so in order to kind of create an educational resource for them and to make it more interactive, they came up with the certification. Um, and that's just kind of creating a, a way for it to be like table stakes. Here's what you can, you can take this course and it, it not, doesn't guarantee, but it helps you understand SMS and it helps you get kind of squared away with your marketing strategies um, plus it's fun, right? It, it takes you through a quiz modules and it helps you kind of learn more about it. Uh, it is a really tremendous tool for our partner organization as well, um, so that they can kind of understand how it works and, and be able to co-sell it with us. Cool. So it's, it's an email course. Is that right? It's like a six parter or a multi-part course. It's, it's in browser. In browser. Yeah. 
Now, yeah, it's in browser, um, a few different, yeah, just a few different modules about like compliance, um, campaigns, uh, pop-ups, that sort of stuff. I think I'm butchering that, but I promise I took it. <laughs> Does this take people through education of the PostScript platform itself, or is this more agnostic about like, these are the policies or things you need to be aware of? Both. Yeah. Oh, so okay. it's, it's like overarching SMS strategy, but then also a little bit in the weeds about how you can do things in PostScript. That's great because I think that's, that's just such a great way for people to learn more about SMS marketing at large, but then also to get really specific advice on PostScript specifically. I think that's great. Yeah, and it's it's applicable to to all SMS. So even if you haven't decided what platform to use, or if you're using another platform, it still makes sense to take the course. Cool. Now, you know, taking a small pivot from content marketing, I do feel like I would be remiss in not asking you about work life balance as a new mom. Um, your daughter is about three or four months old now. Is that right? Yeah, she's 16 weeks. Oh, so sweet. How is it going back to work with a little one at home while you're at home? <laughs> yeah, I mean, had I known that I was going to be becoming a parent in the midst of a global crisis, <laughs> it would have been a little wild. Um, and it's been great. I, you know, look, finding a new job at six months pregnant was such an adventure. It was super empowering. And I specifically remember telling the PostScript team that I was pregnant when I was interviewing and them being just so over the moon excited for me. And I was like, okay, this definitely has solidified the fact that I want to work for them. Um, and it's, I, I feel like it's kind of a blessing to be able to be home and enjoy my time with her. Um, but it's also just a new adventure every day. She changes all the time and it's sometimes hard to keep up with what I should be doing with her and stuff like that. But uh, it's fun. I, I've always kind of seen myself as, as a working mom. Um, and so the fact that I'm actually living that life is really, really crazy to me for sure. Uh, but I'm embracing it. That's really nice. How is it ramping up in a new role? Well, 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 you're ramping up in two new roles. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I should write like some kind of think piece about this. So I basically, I joined it. the script team and then I went on maternity leave around three months afterwards. Um, so it was a lot of just sprinting to get things done and to get a framework in place so that the content marketing could still run while I was gone with the help of my amazing team and then our, our writers as well. So uh, we were planning for Black Friday, Cyber Monday in March. <laughs> uh, we were getting an SEO audit done on our website and creating some SEO driven content as well. Um, and just really sprinting to get stuff done while also creating a maternity leave plan for myself, which was an adventure <laughs> as well. Do you feel like being a, a parent now um, has made you a more efficient employee? I think so. Yeah. I mean, ask me again in like a month when I'm really back in the groove. <laughs> it's been three weeks, but yeah, I, I definitely have taken a harder look at how I spend my time. Um, no longer do I feel comfortable spending 25 minutes just scrolling through my Instagram feed um, or like, I don't know, reading random newsletters or stuff like that. I need to, I, I try to really block off time for what needs to get done because having a newborn is a job in and of itself. Um, it also just, it having my, so I was gone for, I had three months of leave and having my brain completely shift out of e-commerce world and into mom world was a huge shock to my system <laughs> in a way. Um, I, I have always said three months in the regular world is like three years in e-commerce world. And that's totally true. A lot of stuff happened while I was gone, but it also gave me the unique perspective of being able to look at what I have done in e-commerce content and what others are doing um, as a fly on the wall and just make some kind of baseline adjustments to what I wanted to do when I came back. Um, kind of bringing this back to full circle with your, your, philosophy on networking how would you kind of or I guess what's your advice for someone who's entering this e-com space 
and looking to network or, or really just learn from, learn from experienced people, uh, what, what, would, what would your advice to them be? Yeah, I, I can't help but mention the strategy of going to two meetups a week. Maybe make it one just to save yourself some sanity, but it'll be uncomfortable. Uh, imposter syndrome is real, especially if, if you're like an underrepresented group or if you're a woman in tech. Um, but it's fun. It eventually ends up being a lot of fun. So I would say, yeah, start going, start going to meetups or whatever version of meetups is happening virtually. Um, find a mentor or two in the space. They don't have to be in your, your industry, but someone who you really look up to, um, ask them, ask them to be your mentor. That's a pretty good compliment. And then if you, if you're in the e-com space, I have a number of newsletters and people to follow, um, namely 2PM, WebSmith, and then Lean Lux. Um, those are kind of the two overarching, really helpful resources that I think when I say have helped pivot and really amplify my career, it's been following those two sources and reading all I can from them with all the free time that I have. <laughs> well, that's great advice. Thank you so much for, for being here, Corinne. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Questions, comments, find us on Twitter at growthmachine underscore underscore, and we'll see you next week.